I had a, a, a tearful speaking. I dropped flowers at my ancestors in Lexington yesterday, and it was a, a sweet moment, and it brought my brother and I closer together. He was, I texted him, I showed him the picture of the flowers that I put, and he was, we had a nice moment. And thank you, Annie. That's beautiful. We're, uh, we're in a church that's always weird about politics. We hold on one hand this deep tolerance, right? Deep commitment to tolerance, freedom, a desire to not offend anyone, regardless of their any persuasion, really. And on the other hand, we hold this deep commitment to speak out, act on our core values. And then over cereal at home, reading the paper and meeting the church, we bone ourselves for being too complacent as individuals and as a church. It's about right, right? That is who we are. You use are an odd balance of respecting the experience of everyone who's present, making sure people feel included, holding the sacred liberty that people believe, and yet we want to extend our values into civic life as much as we possibly can. And there are no firm rules for the balance of how one does this that there's no like you have to steer with our guts the balance between liberty and justice and today is a little bit about that and the uh, desire to honor memorial day for the sacrifices made ultimate sacrifices made by some for the preservation of our freedom and the very nature of our totalitarian controls that we have and the incredible amount of expense we spend on the military so today is about that. And our prelude, if I were to speak my mind, Travis Edmondson. Yeah. Great song, sung many times by Mary Travis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sing along if you know it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for just one didn't... verse around and uh, catch it the next time. If I were free, if I were free to speak my mind, I'd tell a tale, I'd tell a tale, a tale to humankind of how the flowers, of how the flowers do bloom and fade, do bloom and bloom and fade, of how we fought, how we paid. And how we pay. Give it a try if I were free. If I were free, if I were free to speak my mind, I'd tell a tale. I'd tell a tale, a tale to all mankind of how the flowers, oh, how the flowers do bloom and fade. Do bloom and fade, how we fought. How we fought, how we paid, how we paid. This weary world, this weary world has had its fill of works, of works, of war on every hill. The time has come, the time has come for peaceful days. For peaceful days, for peaceful men, for peaceful men, for peaceful ways, for peaceful ways. Give me one more time. If I were free, I were free. If I were free to speak my mind, I'd tell a tale. I'd tell a tale, a tale to humankind. Of how the flowers did bloom and fade. Of how we fought and how we paid and how we paid. When all mankind, all mankind has ceased to fight, I'll raise my head, I'll raise my raise my head. And thanks each night for this green earth, for this green earth and all it means. And all it, all it means for peaceful nights, peaceful dreams, and peaceful dreams. 
If I were free, if I were free, if I were free to speak my mind, I'd tell a tale, a tale to all mankind of how the flowers do bloom and bloom and fade, of how we fall and how we Annie, would you be so kind as to take that little candle and light our chalice? Yes, I would love to do that. Excellent. William Schultz, who was the president of Amnesty International and the UUA for a while, has a few wise words for us. He says, it is the mission of our faith to teach the fragile art of hospitality to revere both the critical mind and the generous heart the critical mind and the generous heart, to prove that diversity need, need not mean divisiveness, and to witness to all that we must hold the whole world in our hands. Please join me in the Congregational Covenant printed in your bulletin. In this house, we covenant with one another to create a community built on a foundation of love, to work together to promote equality, justice, and peace, accepting responsibility for our individual acts, to stand on the side of love, embracing the liberation of oppressed minorities and working to end discrimination and unjust privilege to communicate with kindness and support, and to serve with compassion and commitment, to listen respectfully and value our diversity as a source of our collective strength, to learn and grow together generously, sharing our time, talents, and treasures, celebrate the joys of discovery from the wonder of youth, to the wisdom of age, to openly share our laughter with in our tears, showing reverence for the divine in all that is. How cool would that be if Congress had to say that every gathering? That would be cool. John McCrae was a Canadian, he wrote, in Flanders Field, which is really a generational poem. Most of us are old enough to have gotten that. I think the younger generation has sort of lost it. He wrote it in 1915 during the First World War. He was a surgeon and it helped popularize the red poppy, which you don't see so much anymore, but you saw as a symbol of remembrance. I'm gonna read the, his poem. In Flanders field, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders field. I want you to think about these words. I'm going to repeat them later. Take up our quarrel with the foe from you, from falling hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. 
If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' field. I'm going to ask us whether that's what dying soldiers actually think. But that's headed our way. On a lighter note, as we head into the offertory, I have some silly words, as I usually do. There was a hunting party. There was a group of friends. They went out hunting. There was a uh, doctor and a lawyer and a pastor. And all of a sudden, this big deer appeared, a buck appeared, and they all turned and shot at it at the same time. No one, it fell. No one was sure who shot it. And then the game warden came around, and the game warden inspected the big buck and had a very clear sense of who shot it. He says, I know who shot it. And they all gather around. How would you, you weren't even here. How do you have any idea? And he said, with much confidence, I can tell you that the pastor shot the buck. And the friends there, the doctor and the lawyer, were amazed that he could so quickly examine and determine who shot it. He said it was clearly easy to figure out who, fin who shot this final blow. It was the pastor. I know that because the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> You like that? <laughs> Please give generously for the work and service of this church. <laughs> I saw the punchline coming, so I, you know. Yeah. And you're going to play a Peter Yao, the great mandala? Yeah, I'm just going to sing it. Fair enough. All right, here we are. So, you let me know when? Right now? Okay, good. Now it's good. Now it's good. Okay. So you just have to make believe that they're playing behind me, but it goes like this. <clears throat> so I told him that he'd better shut his mouth and do his job like a man. And he answered, listen, Father, I will never kill another. He thinks he's better than his brother that died. What the hell does he think he's doing? To his father who brought him upright, take your place on the great Mandela as it moves through your brief moment of time. Win or lose now, you must choose now and if you lose you're only losing your life tell the jailer not to bother with his meal of bread and water today he is fasting Till the killing's over He's a coward He's a martyr He thinks he's a prophet He's just playing a game He can't do it He can't change it It's been going on for 10,000 years Take your place on The great Mandela As it moves Through your brief moment of time Win or lose now We must choose now and if we lose, we're only losing our lives. <laughs> the people, they are safe now. Hunger 
stopped him. He lies still in his cell. Death has gagged his accusations. We are free now. We can kill now. We can hate now. Now we can end the world. We're not guilty. He was crazy. And it's been going on for 10,000 years. Take your place on the great Mandela. As it moves through your brief moment of time. Win or lose now, you must choose now. And if we lose, we're only losing our life. We lose, we're only losing our lives. Awesome. What is the context for that song particularly? Is Peter Yarrow, who wrote the Afghan yeah. Paul Merritt sang. Yeah. The great Mandela. <laughs> I guess let's, let me just say this. Yeah. That I know that uh, he said that it was the most really profound song that, he, that has ever really come through him. Mm. And, uh, you know, especially on Memorial Day. How many people, I think of my friends Wally and Juanita, um, I know when he tried to fast in prison, they stuck a tube down his throat. There's many, many people, but just an awakening. Take your place on the great Mandela. Uh, so many people have stood up and tried, but we're all still trying. <clears throat> Those people that have gone before us, given their lives for freedom and justice and truth, they're still with us. And uh, their voices are heard today as Steve is speaking at the pulpit. And as that song comes through, very moving, uh, I think, probably for all of us. Thank you. Individually and together, we're building a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. Each one of you, by your commitment of time, talent, and treasure given today, helps make that vision real. There's a prayer I've delivered almost every Memorial Day. It's very simple. You can read along. It's estimated that since the first century, 149 million people have died in war. The last century alone counting for 100 million. Let that sit on your heart. In America, and I'm just counting because this is where the documentation is the best, and Americans. In our Civil War, 526,332 American soldiers died, highest percentage of any war. Wow. World War I, 116,516 American soldiers alone dead. World War II, 400,000. 405,399 American soldiers are accounted to have died. Total so soldiers killed in the Great War, 35 million. In the Korean War, 36,913 American soldiers died. In Vietnam, 58,177,000 American soldiers total dead from all sides of that strategic conflict were some 3,434,000. On the agenda of every church, synagogue, sanctuary, mosque should be the ongoing, never-ending commitment to halt the licensed savagery of warfare. To see to it that war, if not completely eliminated, is at least morally crippled to the degree that we know that slavery, 
cannibalism, human sacrifice, and apartheid are in their acceptance. That is my prayer and will be every Memorial Day. Sick. We readily do, as we as a country and all of us should, honor lost soldiers this weekend. Mm -hmm. We honor other dead as well. It's kind of emerged into a tribute for those who've passed who we care about. If my rough, rough calculations are right, there's about 100 million citizens who from the start of our country have lost their lives in war. That accounting notably does not include the Native Americans who died defending their land from what most of us here would quite easily think of as us. That's changing, thankfully. Nor does that figure include the many non-citizen combatants, many of who were formerly enslaved people or actually enslaved African Americans who were not citizens but served in the military. We don't count them. That is a holy mm. sermon of its own, of course. Mm. I probably need not remind you that it requires a great deal of courage and loyalty to put oneself in harm's way for one's country. Whether you have a terrifying, quick, or a slow, painful death as a result of war, roughly one million, and I'm just speaking about Americans, not because they're more important than other people, of course, have had the experience, about a million Americans have had the experience of watching themselves lose the only life we know we're given. <coughs> it's almost unfathomable to, to my privileged self that people actually do this. <laughs> Given the twisted way the world has and is presently structured, we simply don't have the freedom and privilege we have without that sacrifice. Other churches will talk about that part a whole lot. It is worth saying. We should never forget that. As many churches will this weekend, I want to start this service with an earnest bow to those who have given their lives in service of our country and my and our freedom. The only life we know we have is lived in all right, Great baby, I'm going to go out, but I will be lived. back. And I deeply respect okay. that they've done this. And at the same time, no, time I despise the systems and the structures in place that have driven them to have to do that. Mm -hmm. The image that's seared in my mind that I think about a lot, having skydived once, <laughs> once, I'll be baby. I'll be back freely soon. chosen. The image I have is when soldiers jump out of perfectly good planes in the middle of the night to float down into pitch black under enemy gunfire. Let's take a moment of silence for the people who actually have done that. <laughs> McCray closes his famous poem, as I asked you to remember, Flanders Field, speaking of the soldiers who died in battle in World War I. And his poem requests those that, that are listening to pick up their torch from their failing hands and take up the quarrel with, their, with our foe. And then poetically urges those who are still living that if we fail to do so, we break faith with those who have died. The last stanzas of that pretty poem beg an interesting question. Do those who die in battle generally feel more loyal to the cause of the war that they're dying in and because of, or as they lay dying, do they just as often curse the war for taking their life and the stupidity of the whole thing? It's a powerful question to ask, because there's a wisdom in that moment, I'm sure. A unique moment. We all have moments of unique wisdom. When you're laying dying from a battle, I'm sure you've got some poignant thoughts. And I'm sure that people feel both things. Just imagine yourself for a minute laying on a battlefield in some make or in some makeshift war hospital across any of the wars. Pick a spot yourself. 
Would you wish to, as you lay dying there, hand the battle to others so they could fight on? Or do you think, as you watch the life drain from you, the futility of war washes over you more? Most churches would never ask that question from the pulpit, but here we do. Thankfully, none of us are gonna likely be faced with that choice. Most of us are frankly too old, and we're second too privileged to find ourselves at risk of dying in war. Thank God for that. And although we don't experience it this way, we, you, me, all of us are active participants in the violence of war in the world today more than we like to think we are. We, as a general small demographic of people are more aware of that. And that is simply because our nation is the chief agent of militarizing the world. Without ever putting on a uniform or holding a gun, we as simply as citizens of the U.S. are an active part of the violence in the world. As of 2019, the last results being in, I was able to find eight, the U.S. had 800 military installations around the world. 800, slightly more actually. And there's two maps, like, there's a bigger map, may, maybe some of you have grabbed, there's one on the insert that I put in there. The first map has the larger stars indicating countries with at least 50 bases. Yeah. Look at it, right? That's the large stars, the small stars are just where we have military bases. The second map, let's take a look at the first one. Kind of right across the middle of the world where most people live. We, we have a military presence almost everywhere. The second map here accounts for where and to what extent we have performed military actions from 2018 alone to 2020. The yellow, Small map, I know. Are places the U.S. have trained counter-terrorist forces within a country. The green are places where the U.S. has performed military training operations themselves. We, our people, have been there. That's the green. And the orange actually identify a place where we've had military troops who've had boots on the ground and actually engaged with terrorists as the phrase goes. And the red is where we performed either air or drone strikes just in two years. That's a lot. Our actions overseas buy us a lot of power, no doubt prevent terrorist acts. They also at the same time create some of the dissent that fuels terrorist acts. The proportions of each are impossible to determine this is largely unexamined by the American public who feels bad making the military, well, feel bad. We don't like to do that. It made me start to think about how we could get this huge, expensive, costly issue just up for moral consideration. And there's a famous, it was a couple of years ago, there's a thing called the school games and they, you know, it's a competition and that kind of got me stirring. And then I just wonder what kind of internet, like what kind of meme-like thing would get us tuned in on this, right? And in, 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 you know, in a TikTok generation. And I thought, what if Americans, now that we can gamble on things legally in Massachusetts, what if Americans could wager on whether Kim Kardashian gets married again before our nation commits, say, 100 drone strikes? What if you could bet on that? It'd be good. To, it's terrible, but it would be good. What, if, what about the idea of a public lottery on military actions and celebrity behaviors? Maybe that would be the gutter experience we as a people would need to put on ourselves to have a moral conversation that's real. And in the spirit of trying to break the spell of not only respecting the military, I've dreamed up a couple advertisements. You know, you see the ones with the soldiers and now they've got, they almost look like video games. They come down and they're like superstars. I came up with a couple of scenarios that might help us 
The first vision is an advertisement I might imagine released over Memorial Day weekend sometime. The voiceover starts, at this time when we honor the troops and people are just more or less receive their ta re tax refund checks, let's take a peek at our government books and see if there's any activity on our collective moral balance sheet we should look at. And in this skit, there's two sort of military types, but they're accountant military types. There's desk computers, there's papers around. Voice one says, okay, so the figures so far, we sort of tune in on this, appear about right. We've been in the war on terror for just over 20 years, 21, and we've lost more than 7,000 of our U.S. soldiers to death. The voice two interjects and says, when we run the numbers, Mm, that means for a 21-year campaign, about once a day, one more of our soldiers get sacrificed, roughly. We lose a soldier a day in the war on terror. The other voice comes in and says, that means if each state would have supplied an equal number of soldiers, which of course they have not, that means that each state would have offered seven of their young people you generally to this campaign each year. The other voice, Voice two says, however, as hard as it might be to put hard numbers on the death of our soldiers, when we look at the lives lost in World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, the war on terror is significantly under budget on what we've determined the American public can stomach. The other voice says, especially if we're gonna limit the media access to caskets coming home, which we did in Iraq. Voice two says, how about injuries? How are we doing on that? Voice two says, I don't have the exact data, but if the estimations of those injured keep pace with the current rate of about nine serious injuries to each fatality, since the war on terror began roughly 20 years ago, about 80,000 American troops have been injured. For that 21 year operation, that's not too far from a significant injury about every two hours or so. The other voice says, again, affordable to the American psyche. But remember, the injuries in this war are generally worse than the other wars because more of our troops survive than before, which is great on one hand. However, how much would that cost us financially? They start scratching out some numbers. When we figure in the estimated cost of medical care and disability payments, well, the only appropriate word is wow. A towering 2.2 trillion of the estimated financial costs for future care has already been set aside for military veterans. That's about a quarter of the cost of all of our military expenses over the last 20 years in the war on terror. When we, ask the, we add the cost of rebuilding our depleted military to the desks, not to mention the suffering, quite practically the expense of caring for disabled soldiers and for the Iraq war alone, on that account we're talking more than $3 trillion for Iraq alone. Something's gonna have to be done. The other voice says, we could cut benefits. Oh yeah. We'll do that, the other says. We've shifted some of those costs to nonprofit campaigns and charitable causes. This is all compounded, but the real problem we face is that when we figure out the debt accumulated from our war on terror. You start talking in figures that move with the monetary equivalent of the speed of light. True enough, our expenses from the early part of our campaign have dropped, but at the start of the Iraq war, in nearly 2,000, we as a nation were spending about $240 million a day. After scratching and tapping on a piece of paper, that means that for the first quarter of the decade, nationally our spending broke down into just under $10 million an hour. Wow, the other voice says. Real quick, it gets to the place just like where the numbers of the stars in the sky your eyes just glaze over at the dollar numbers we're speaking of. The other voice says, that's what we're banking on. You know, a million here, a billion there. Pretty soon people's minds just go blank. 
Don't be too disheartened, though, the other person says. Remember, those numbers will not only be divided among the 330 million citizens of the United States, but spread out over future generations. Well, if that's the case, the other one says, I think we can afford that. The screen fades to black. Then we hear the narrator speak. You wouldn't hand your checkbook over to anyone and let them write your checks. You wouldn't let someone vote for you. You would certainly want to know who had your car keys and how they were driving. To any longer let our government play world cop in our name is not unlike not canceling your stolen credit card. Can you imagine that ad on Memorial Day on a television station? That advertisement would be never promoted, never shown on a major network or cable television station. And I want you to think about that the next time a military advertisement with lean young men climbing sandstone mountains or women being digitally morphed into superheroes comes on the television. Think about the fact that a private person or a party could not get advertisements like that in a major network or distribution. And then ask yourself if we're having a real moral conversation about war in this country. It's immensely complicated. I'm not saying it's simple that pursuing Osama bin Laden was a fruitless act or that Saddam Hussein was a good leader. They're dangerous terrorists and thugs in the world, whether we should be funding Ukraine or not funding Ukraine. I'm just asking us to simply consider that maybe America is one of those thugs too. America spends as much on its military as somewhere between nine and the next 11 countries combined spend on military expenses. What I'm asking us to think about is the way that we all look at ourselves morally. The very simple fact that there are people in times when inevitably bad actors do need to be constrained is true. And yet, how does it feel to be a passive contributor to the world's largest military arms dealer and empire? It's hard. There are no easy answers. Maybe we should do just what we're doing. All options are imperfect. All I'm saying is that we have a steady track record of being involved with conflicts that kill so many, cost so much, and so often fail that it demands some honest reflection, doesn't it? I have an idea to test the conviction of those that lobby the hardest for a big war budget. What if the military contractors that made up roughly 50% of our military budget and growing only got paid when they successfully completed the nation building efforts they, we, we pay them so handsomely to do? What if like an investor in a capital venture has to, they had to raise their own capital for the, for the adventures that they seem to encourage us to want to do? And if they didn't want to do that, why not? Let's push the idea further. What if the military itself was only paid for su the successful completion of a task? It would be unthinkable, right? Why? Because we're afraid to say hard things about the most courageous and brave in our country? Or that we like playing world cop and having that support our multinational endeavors? Or maybe because we're apart and afraid that we're just one nation among many, which we tend not to think we are. Given the very primitive measure of success we should hold ourselves to, we should at least hold ourselves to the idea that we have left a place better than we arrived. Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, all of those at least left in the question mark. In 1961, not Gandhi, not Martin Luther King, not Abby Hoffman, but General Dwight D. Eisenhower said in his farewell speech as the President of the United States, acknowledging and even promoting the need for a large military budget, he said, 
In the councils of government, we should must guard against the we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. His phrase, Eisenhower's phrase. What are we doing as a nation tells the world about who we are? The terrorists ought to think about how they're viewed. So ought we. Religiously, we in this room, anyone who defines themselves as a UU, inherit a morality that trains us to be more, con more, con more concerned with collective behavior than personal behavior. That's pretty rare as a church. We have our obligations personally, but in our country, we generally inherit a morality that focuses on individual behavior, who you sleep with, whether your soul is going to heaven and whether you lie. We turn away from the collective because it's confusing. I'll repeat my earlier call for respect for the troops. They deserve it. They do scary things I don't want to do, and our freedom isn't free. Totally true. It requires a combination of great courage and incredible loyalty to put oneself in harm's way for one's country. No, no knock on that. However, as much as we praise in the courage to fight, we must resist the systems that exist that divide us from our overall oneness and resist not looking at the hard things that we do. Amen. I'm going to pass on the reading of The Last Soldier and head us right into joys and concerns, personal joys and sorrows. This is there's a time later for announcements. This is a time for the community to carry what's on your heart. And Kate's going to hand around a microphone or let you do that. And you can come light a candle. I already got one lit over there. For all who are visitors, thank you for being here today. I'd like to light, have you light a candle for um, Dan Tynan, who is serving our tech, leading our tech crew, and um, I think he's moving on in four days or so. Um, so, for appreciation to Dan for all that he's done over the years. I know he'll be back off and on, but still, he's moving. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, I'm Annie. Uh, let me see. I'd like to say things of joy for the people, a candle for joy for all the young people, middle-aged, whatever, that stand for truth and justice. They're out there. Sometimes it seems like the negative gets more uh, publicity in the papers and things, but I beg to differ. Like Pete Seeger, us and our teaspoons. That's how we're gonna change things. And the candle of uh, sorrow. Within 10 days, I lost my bird, Bubba, first. And then 10 days later, my dog. Oh. So uh, they're on their happy hunting ground. I miss them terribly, but still I can sing. So there you go. Thank you. My name is Pam, and um, I want to light a candle for James Burleson. James Burleson lived with us for about three months. He is Lauren's nephew. And when he needed to find a job, he couldn't find a job. And he wanted to sign up in the military because if he signed up in the military, he had no parents to help him. He had, um, we couldn't afford to send him to college. So he wanted to sign up in the military. We did our best to talk him out of it. 
but that was the job training program that he could find. Mm -hmm. Was the job training program he could find. And since then, he has not signed up in the military, but he got a job driving trucks mm -hmm. across country. So he's solved that problem, sort of. But what I'm thinking about is all the many people who sign up in the military because they can't get job training. And I'm thinking about why, why are we investing so much of our people and money for dismal job training that teaches people to kill. And now it's coming home to roost. And it weighs heavily on my soul. And um, I'm looking at the job training program that is emerging out of the green revolution that we are about to embark upon in this state. It's in five-year plans over the next from now to 2050, 30 years worth of job training, high value job training with jobs that are decent and that will actually make a difference and could make an enormous difference to our survival as human beings on the face of the earth. So if this church took on helping young people get signed up for those jobs. That would be a gift. And we could do that right here. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for uh, peace to break out nationwide or globally. Believe me, we can just book it. Anybody on Zoom? Struggling mightily with mental illness. I also would like you to light a candle of memory for my dad, Arthur Peck, who served in World War II and who was incredibly graced by acing a language test that meant instead of having to fight in World War II, he got to study Japanese and go over and help with all of the post-war reconciliation work and make a lot of really friends in Japan, and uh, only slightly less significant, a candle of joy for Derek White, who hit a shot with five <laughs> seconds remaining to get the, the, the next step in their miracle comeback from being down 3-0 to tying the series 3-3. Please join me in our, thank you for sharing. Please join me in our song to friends, prayer to friends, in the insert of your hymnal. Annie's gonna lead us in that. Right, here we go. Here we are. To this day I, I bring my life, life born of hope, hope born of sand, yearning joy where of their strife, all I have, all I am. Help me, help me to see what I must see. Help me to be where 
restless faith abide till all are free. Will my life turn my hand? Wayne Arneson says, Take courage, my friends. The way is often hard, the path never clear, and the stakes very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. And now, a little ditty from Phil Oakes. <laughs> a little ditty. <laughs> Oh, the other thing, uh, the other little song I was thinking about, a little tongue in cheek, was, and I'm sure it wouldn't bother anybody except for a small circle of friends that kind of went along with your sermon. So, here we go. What's that I hear ringing in my ears? I heard that sound before. That I hear ringing in my ears. I hear it more and more. It's the sound of freedom calling, rising up to the sky. It's the sound of the always falling. You can hear it if you try. I can hear it if you try, can hear it if you try. What's that I see shining in my eyes? I've seen that light before. What's that I see shining in my eyes? I see it more and more. It's the light of Freedom shining, rising up to the sky. It's the light of the always falling. You can see it if you try, can see it if you try, can see it if you try. What's that I feel beating in my heart? I felt that beat before. What's that I feel beating in my heart? I feel it more and more. It's the beat of freedom calling, rising up to the sky. It's the heart of the always falling. You can feel it if you try, can feel it if you try, can see it if you try, can see it if you try, can hear it if you try. Yeah. Thank you, Annie. It's the last time for, uh, not last time, it's the time for community announcements, and Kate's going to run around playing Phil Donahue. Seekers group is going to meet out in the side yard today, and our topic is What Do You Trust? Hope you'll join us. About 15 minutes after we have coffee. Okay. And the tree group is still going, and we, we've had one meeting, but we have been really active. We've been attending the uh, state legislators hearings like about four of them so they are having hearings on working lands we are starting a nursery a tree nursery in Nancy Forrest's backyard we have uh, Tom Sullivan helping us with the design and trying to find the right pots for trees which have to be really tall 
There's about five or six things that are underway with the tree group. If you're interested, see me after the service. Mary, I'm interested. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's a annual meeting that uh, it's very important to come to. It's going to be the second weekend, the second Sunday of, of June, which happens to be the 11th. We're going to have a flower communion, going to have choir, going to have bell ringing, food, and then annual meeting. So please come the 11th after the service. Uh, I'm going to be away next weekend, so I cannot be the greeter. Uh -huh. Is there somebody who can commit now to being the greeter next Sunday? Or shall it just sort of like happen that? Mary? All right. Thank you, Mary. That reminds me, I want to announce that David L Ragland is going to talk about the sacred act of reparations. And so he's going to be in the pulpit with um, Brian Bender playing music. And I do hope we have a good turnout for, for him. Jay, I have a little, uh, just a little cookie. Just use the mic. Use the mic? Yeah, oh, just use the mic. He yeah. said, just a, so I take my hat off to Steve, oh. a truth teller. Tell it, tell it like it is at Unity Church, but you stand for truth, you are truth, and you speak your truth, and you walk in that way. And to me, that's the deepest thing that a human can, can do right now. So I want to thank you for what you had to say today. And, being allowed to be with you up here. Well, thank, thank you. you. I, I do less than I should. That's very clear. Uh, I'm a person of privilege, and I'm privileged to be here. Thanks. And I want to thank Annie, too. Yeah. Wonderful music. Also, on June 11th, we'll be ringing the bells during the church service. So if anyone would like to have a chance to do that, you're welcome to join me in the belfry at 11, at about five minutes of 11 we'll get set up. Thank you. We've got watermelon and rhubarbs with uh, half decaf coffee. And I also want to thank Kate, who probably had a big hand in all, all right. of that post-service happening and is about as good as we're going to get for impersonating Phil Donahue. <laughs> Here we go. Go in peace. Stay in peace. Go to the Seekers meeting. Talk to... Amen. Talk to, no, we're good. I'm good. Talk to Pam. Thanks for coming to church. It's a great tradition. Don't give it up. There's full, I, gave, I created a few more full flyers that are easier to read back there if you want to take some home and talk about this issue with your friends and family. Amen. And Dan, Dan's been a, Dan is a blessing to the, this whole valley. He's the most important Unitarian Universalist in the region. <laughs> and I'm going to slash his tires. And I'm going to spray paint the side of his house so it doesn't sell. <laughs> and all of those things. I, I second that, Steve. <laughs> I did. Okay, just, it's just me now. <laughs> ah, dear, let's see here. Let's go to uh, gallery. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, let's see here. Let's put, let me uh, see. Thank, you, thank you, Dan, you, you will be missed. Thank you. You mean, you mean you're, not gonna, you're not gonna Zoom from from the West Coast? Um, 
Not like, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, that's possible. That's possible. I mean, I'm going to be back here trying to do half the time, but it's probably going to be more like a third of the time. Mm. Um, so I'll be back and forth. I'm going to try to be by coastal. I'm, my wife is selling our house in Conway, but I'm keeping my house in Shelburne. So I have to come back and take care of that and do all that stuff. So that's the, that's the story. A lot to do. Yeah. Let me stop. Uh, let me stop uh, YouTube. Sorry.